I am incredibly happy to wrap up Privacy Week with our uh, final glory. We've got the author Jeff Jarvis here to um, give us a talk about his most recent book, which is called Public Parts, and which covers and stands up for the value of information and the value of sharing in a digital world. So within the set of people who talk about and argue about privacy publicly, um, we've, there are a whole lot of people out there talking about the importance of you know, being very careful not to share when you don't want to, being very careful to have spaces that are not public, having things that are secret. And Jeff's voice is a really important counterbalance to speak up for the importance in a healthy society of actually talking to each other, of actually having things to say, um, as he would say, or sharing. And as someone who has loomed kind of large on the Google landscape ever since his previous book, What Would Google Do? It's really, really great to have him in this conversation with us. And I expect he's going to have a lot of stimulating things to say to us today. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Um, did any of you attend the last talk I gave here, which was on privacy? Okay, some of you, because I, I, I promise this is part two, so, but I'll, 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 I'll go through a quick spiel of part one. Is because actually I want to talk more about publicness and privacy. Uh, because I was brought here before to do a privacy event, but let me go through pretty quickly where that goes. And, and yes, by the way, I am a, the most certified Google fanboy there is, having written a book um, uh, telling the world to think like you. Uh, I, I also was very happy the first time I came here to give a, a, a book talk on that book. My fear was I was now in the room with, with rocket scientists who could tell me just how full of shit I was. Uh, but you were all too polite to have done so, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, so this time I wanted to write about uh, publicness, but to get there I had to go through privacy. And privacy and publicness are not binary, they don't, they don't fight with each other. Yeah? Is this event private or are we allowed to post publicly? You may, uh, my life is an open blog, you know, I, 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 I have no secrets. It's going to be posted on YouTube. It's going to be posted on YouTube too. But yeah, no, okay. post away, post away, yes. No, please, I love it. Can it at Jeff Jarvis, Twitter. <laughs> Jeff Jarvis on Google+, Buzz Machine. Uh, Facebook slash Jeff Jarvis, that's, you know, it's, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm delighted. Um, now we'll get to talk about oversharing in a second, but <laughs> self-promotion. Um, so, so history, uh, privacy and, and publicness are like hot and cold, like wet and dry, it is a continuum, it's not either or, and I think that's very, very important. Um, and, but I tried to look at privacy, and again, I'm trying to, I'm gonna rush through this part, but a little bit of the history of privacy, which I mentioned last time, is that I didn't realize that the first serious legal discussion about privacy or legal right to privacy did not come in the U.S. until 1890 with the invention of a technology, the Kodak camera. Tied to the rise of the penny press freaked people out because suddenly my picture, oh my God, my picture could be anywhere. And, and Teddy Roosevelt uh, banned Kodaking, as it was called, in Washington Parks briefly because he didn't want pictures taken of him or his family. And look how we've changed as a society and how our norms have changed around, please take a picture of me, everywhere except Germany. Um, and uh, uh, so what we're going through now is changes of norms around this. Uh, a fairly obvious thing, but, but in the earliest villages, of course, there was very little privacy. We walked through each other's huts, uh, the first homes we did. It was an invention of the hall and the invention of the back stairs that, that led to a society that, that started to have expectations of privacy. Um, those were technologies in their way, in their time. And it's said that privacy was kind of invented in, in England of that time. So privacy hasn't been around forever. Um, I struggled a lot with the definitions of privacy and it turns out to be very, very, very difficult, I found, to, to get to a definition because it's an empty vessel word. Uh, as even some of the people who study privacy and know it well say, uh, it means everything and nothing. Uh, Brandeis and Warren, who wrote that 1890 law essay about privacy that really led to the, to the bringing privacy into American law, said that it gets down to the right to be let alone. And what they really said is that it's about feelings. And so when we try to talk about the harm based on privacy, it becomes very difficult because it really is about feelings. It's about your fear of what someone else might think of you that they may never say. In fact, they may not think it. It's what's so insidious about it. It's you're imagining, you're fearing what they might think. 
And that, that becomes a lot of the essence of the emotions around privacy. Other things like identity theft and fraud and those kinds of things and stalking, I think are separate crimes. I, I think part of the problem with privacy is we throw a lot into that bucket. But privacy itself, even Brandeis and Warren say that it, it has a, a basis in emotion. Um, so that's all I want to say about privacy, believe it or not, uh, in Privacy Week. I it was a whole week. I mean, gosh, should be here a week. Uh, so, but of course it's private, so no one knew about it. <laughs> So I'm happy to talk any bit more you want about privacy. Uh, or I, actually, one more thing. So I come to, finally, if I can't define it very well, I come to view privacy as an ethic, an ethic of knowing. And so the idea here is that if I uh, tell Chris something quietly, then the resp it is public to that extent, right? Same as circles. You tell one person it's public to that extent. So at that point, then, um, what the responsibility for what to do with that information lies on Chris's shoulders. And he has to make a whole series of judgments as to, well, did, did I think Jarvis, what's the context? Was it said to me in private? Is it harmful to him if I spread that around? Do I not like him and I want to spread it around as a result? Uh, do I have a responsibility as a company to keep this data secure? And so on and so on. And so the, the ethics that you go through in your list really are somewhat mirrored to the ethics that I try to deal with there. Don't steal information from people. Don't fool them out of it. Um, keep it secure. Give them access to it, to their own information. Make it portable, data liberation front, um, uh, and so on. So I have a list of those. The complementary ethic is an ethic of publicness. Now we'll get to publicness. And the idea there is it's an ethic of sharing. That it says that if I know something that could be helpful to someone else, then I'm going to make a decision as to whether or not to share that. And I'm not arguing that everything should be public, everything should be out there, uh, that all of life is transparent. I go through a list of things in my book of the things that I don't really want to share. I don't really want to share income. Now in Scandinavia, they share income and taxes, but here we don't. And I don't know why I don't want to, but I don't. But then I go along and say, but I am a teacher at a public university with a contract, so you can find out what I make. In fact, today on my blog, uh, after I, I, somebody I won't mention uh, eviscerated me yesterday. Uh, and I'm not gonna give him any freaking credit. Uh, I said that on YouTube. Um, so uh, uh, he, he tried to say that I was, I was hypocritical because I was not willing to say my income. Well, no, I was just explaining my emotions. And indeed, I did then say my income, pathetic as it is, uh, as a university professor, and then some of my comments on the blog today came in and pointed to a site I didn't know existed that has my income up there on the site, but that's fine, because I'm public. Um, so, um, an ethic of sharing. I was at the World Trade Center on 9-11. I wrote about that in my last book. Uh, since then, I've gotten prostate cancer, thyroid cancer, and a heart condition. <laughs> now you know everything you want to know about me, and more. Now. The fact that that happened probably wasn't correlated in 9-11, but what if it were? That data point, those three data points, are of value potentially to other people who were there. So I can choose to share them or choose not to share them. I can choose to share them with a circle or with the world, right? But uh, to choose not to do so, I think at some point in society we could see that as selfish, as antisocial, right? And that gets me in trouble. But I think we've got to get to a society where it is possible to do that. Without, so why wouldn't I share health? Well, let's talk about the, the notion of radically sharing health. And this came, I, I gave a talk at the Google headquarters in New York and somebody from the health team was there. So this is what actually inspired this. What if we shared every bit of our health data? Why don't we? Well, one reason is we may not get a job. But that's society's problem. That's a legal issue about the use of the data that says that if you discriminate at me against, because I have a sickness, we can declare that illegal. I mean, I get insurance. And even if that is private data, the insurance company can get all my medical records, so it's really not very private as far as they're concerned. The other reason is stigma. We have a stigma in society about certain illnesses. And that's why when I talked about my prostate cancer and my malfunctioning penis, I did it for a reason in the book because it tries to get past that stigma. I also got incredible benefit back for it. People gave me advice that I would never have gotten because they knew publicly. I had friends who'd had the operation 10 years before. I didn't know they'd had it. Because I was public, they knew I was going to have it. They came to me and gave me great advice. Finally, we as a group tried to inspire other men 
to get tested for PSA. And most of you are too young for this. But no matter what the government said last week, I still say get your PSA tested because more information is always better than less information. And surely that's something you believe here at Google. Anyway, so there are benefits to publicness and benefits to sharing, benefits to society and generosity, benefits to the individual. So I try to list those benefits in the book. And part of my reason I'm doing so is I think it's important for the likes of Google and Facebook and Twitter to start to sell the benefits of publicness. Because the conversation is all about privacy, all about what could go wrong. And if we manage life all to the worst case, we'll never discover the best case. And this is the valley of the best case. Right? I'm accused all the time of being an internet uh, utopian. Here's utopia, right? <laughs> And it feels so good. <laughs> and it's true. It's true what they say about heaven. Yeah, all the food you can eat. Uh, uh, so, sorry, that just threw me off. Uh, where, 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 where was I? Um, so the benefits. We've got to sell the benefits of this because if the conversation is only the worst case, only what could go wrong, only the fear, then that's what rules so much of what you do. And not in a marketing way, but in a real way, we've got to try to go shift the conversation to the benefits of publicness, to the good things that happen when people can connect to each other and information and action and so on. So I list a bunch of benefits. They're the ones I list, but it's about making relationships. It's about the, the notion of killing the idea of a stranger. I've, I've made so many friends. I've met so many people who are now no longer strangers. It's the idea of killing or disarming at least stigmas. I argue in the book that publicness was the best weapon that gays and lesbians in this country had to force back the bigots who had forced them into the closet. And I do not suggest for one second that anyone should be forced out of or dragged out of that closet. But those who had the courage to do so stood up to the bigots and said, okay, okay, so we're gay. You got a problem with that? As we would say in New Jersey. Um, and that's a very, very powerful force. Uh, publicness brings the potential for collaboration. Publicness allows us to collect the wisdom of the crowd. Publicness, I think, starts to fight down the myth of perfection, which we have from the industrial age, that everything we make is perfect and everything we do is perfect. Well, you guys fight that down with the beta. Right? And, that's, and that's a huge, I think, gift to society is the example that you can put something out. And if you put it out and it's not done, then it's necessarily a call for collaboration. It is, in my view, the beta is a very... Uh, important sign of humanity and humility, even from God Google. And uh, that is because you are public with the process of what you do. Uh, publicness gives credit. Um, I, I try to argue even immortality. If you're, if you're not public, then no one will remember you afterwards. Um, and finally, it allows us to organize ourselves. Uh, I get to say in front of the God of the hashtag uh, that we're witnessing something amazing in... Um, in, in Occupy Wall Street, of a revolution based on a hashtag. Part of my theory, by the way, that I started to play with a little bit in the book, but keep playing with since, is that I see more and more life coming to imitate and mimic the architecture of the net. And this is an example where that's happening. Um, this is a case where people are confused as hell about Occupy Wall Street because they say, where's the structure? Where's the organization? Who's the leader? What are the goals? No, no one owns a hashtag. There is no organization, there is no structure, there is no hierarchy, there is no creed. It's an idea that people put something into. I think it was after I was here last time, I um, had a few, I violated one of the rules in my book, which is the Cabernet rule, never to, uh, don't allow friends to tweet, blog, Google Plus or anything after too much wine. <laughs> well, it wasn't Cabernet, it was Pinot Noir, but I was really pissed off in the midst of the uh, so-called negotiations over the debt. And I went, sat down and I said, you know, fuck you, Washington. Um, ooh. Um, you know, it's our money, it's our economy, you're messing with it. Yeah. And then I joked and I said, you know, we should have a chant on Twitter. And then somebody came in and said, maybe for all I know, it may have been Chris and one of a different identity, uh, you idiot, that's called a hashtag. And so I said, right, fuck you, Washington. And um, people got mad at me, some did, for not making it FU Congress or FU this person or that person. But what, what fascinated me about this was people filled in the rest of the sentence when they used the hashtag. F you Washington, because my parents don't know whether they can pay their bills next month. F you Washington, because you won't let me marry who I want to. F you Washington, because you idiots can't negotiate like a three-year-old. 
And it was a blank slate. Well, similarly, I think Occupy Wall Street is a bit of a blank slate and people are putting upon it their beliefs and their frustrations. And now we're seeing a process of discernment in public to bring out, well, why are you occupying Wall Street? What do you want? What are you pissed about? And we're starting to hear it. And media can't figure this out, but the people who are there can. Um, so organizing us. Another way that I think I see the internet structure coming to society is news. That in Tahrir Square, um, we saw people didn't, Andy Carvin at NPR didn't say to the New York Times, didn't say to the people in Tahrir Square, hey, why don't you crowdsource your revolution? Send your pictures to CNN. and You could be a field reporter for us. No, they use these tools for the revolution. They use the tools for what they wanted and we could watch because they did it in public. And so what you saw there was the architecture of the net end to end, witness to world, brought to life. And I find that kind of fascinating that uh, uh, because it was in public that was happening. Now, Andy Carvin at NPR, I'm sure you all know, sat at a distance and added value to that, added journalistic value to that. Who's really there? Who's not there? Uh, debunking rumors, confirming things, and so on and so forth. But that notion of the architecture happening in public. Well, part of what this goes to too is the notion, the question of what is a public? What is the public? So I dared to go into Habermas a bit in the book. I didn't study Habermas in school. I'm an amateur at Habermas, I will confess. I found him rather indigestible. Um, <laughs> but those of you who have studied, how many of you have had to study Habermas? Okay, thank you, thank you, right, right. So by the way, somebody, this person who eviscerated me, who I'm not gonna mention, um, took me to task because I mentioned Habermas and Oprah Winfrey in the same book. That's how kind of holy he is. Uh, but he's very important because he defines the, the terms of the conversation about the notion of the public sphere. And Habermas argues that it was all, not until the 18th century that we had in the form of rational critical debate in salons and cafes, the formation of a public sphere that was for the first time a force counterweight to government, to the king. And I think he's right, I think it was important. I don't know that the, the discussion was necessarily so rational and critical then, but he then argues that it was corrupted by mass media coming in and changing uh, the tenor of that. Well, I then came across some researchers out of McGill who did a wonderful project on the making of the modern public. And they finally decided that there were the tools to make public before the 18th century. That when 3,000 people gathered in the Globe Theater to watch Richard III, it is Richard III who's the bad king? You're a smart crowd, right? Or was it second? Third, third, thank you, okay, good, thank you, okay, good. So Richard the, see, I, I'm not an academic. Um, Richard the III, uh, a public is formed around the idea of what do we do when we have an incompetent ruler? So the stage, the book, of course, uh, maps, art, markets, printed sermons, all these things were tools in the early modern period, the early Renaissance, for making publics. And so what I think starts to happen here is we come back around now uh, and we see that uh, this corruption of the public sphere that Habermas laments, and I agree with him on this, we now have the opportunity to turn this around today because we, you create the tools that enable people to create their own publics. I was on Twitter today and, and um, I forget what brought it up, but I said something about media, or I think Clay Shirky, uh, what, by the way, there's a law that says all internet optimists must quote Clay Shirky once a day. So I'm about to, to fulfill my legal obligation. And um, Clay was talking about media and somebody said in Twitter, maybe we should have Occupy um, Media. And I said, we've already done that. That's what this is. <laughs> this, you're in the midst of it, right? So we have these tools to create publics. And indeed, I think that Habermas's idea of the, the public sphere was a bastardization of the notion of many publics. And, and he knows that and there's been debates about that as well. But I, I think what we have now is the power to create many, many publics. And that's what you do. You give people the ability to gather together around an idea, an event, a need, um, a thought, a joke, anything. You and these other tools enable that. Search enables it uh, and so on. So what happens to media in this world? Well. It used to be that there was only one way to get to content, one means of discovery and distribution, brands. You had to buy the newspaper, the magazine, the book, watch the TV show, whatever. Then along came search. You turned it around so that now people who asked the question could 
um, start the process. And if you had an answer, great. If you didn't, you weren't there, you didn't live. But now there is, I believe, the next layer of this is sharing as a means of content discovery and distribution. And that's what Zuckerberg wants. That's why he has the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post and The Guardian on Facebook. That's what you want, I think, with Google+. Uh, the more we can add signals. So I argue that the Senate was way wrong when they brought your executive chairman to the carpet uh, on the basis of controlling search. That was yesterday's war. I think the current war is signal, bless you, is signal generation. And I, I'm telling you you're a business, but what I see from afar is that you, through uh, Google+, through certainly through Android, and through other means, and Facebook and others are trying to get people to generate signals about themselves so that you can better serve them more relevant content and services and, yes, advertising. And so signal generation becomes very important. It's who we are, where we are, who do we know, uh, what do we like, what do we buy, what don't we like, uh, where are we going, where have we been, uh, all of what, you know, what's our behavior. All of these things are, of course, signals. But of course, that starts to freak people out because it goes into privacy. And part of what we have to do, I think, is do a better job of selling the idea to people that there is value to this. And we don't do that by telling them that there's value to this. We do that, I think, by uh, showing them. Because you get this, you get that. So I get people all the time you know, who will ask me about cookies. We've demonized cookies. We've demonized this notion of tracking. And that's partly the fault of us in this industry, and I include in that media and advertising, because we didn't explain to people what we were doing, why we were doing it, what they were getting out of it. And they discovered it from after the fact, and they got freaked. And maybe they should have. Um, but I tell them all the time, you can go into Chrome, a wonderful browser, and you can have an incognito window, and you can cut off all your cookies. Your experience is going to be that you get dancing monkey ads again and again and again. And there's an ethical question there that you've now devalued yourself as a user with those media sites who are giving you stuff for free. And if enough people do that, if we have do not track legislation, the ultimate unintended consequence of that could be, I believe, content dying or content going behind walls, which is not good for us all at all. So there's a reason to try to sell this, and I, and I hope that you do that. Um, so out of media to a few more thoughts, then I really want to have a conversation because every time I talk to Googlers, I get a headache because you have such great thoughts and I want to get to that because it helps me. Um, Oversharing. Uh, I, I was accused by one person of oversharing because I wrote about my penis in public. And oddly, this guy, he didn't like me anyway. There are people like that out there. It's the price of publicness is you get the haters. And, and, and this guy never liked me. Uh, oddly, he also had prostate cancer. Um, but he said I was oversharing. Well, it's an odd concept, oversharing, because what he's really doing is telling me to shut up. Right? He's telling me, don't share this. Well. The beauty of the architecture we have on the net today is there's a very easy to answer that. Unfollow me, defriend me, uncircle me, don't click on me. There's all these ways that you don't have to hear what I have to say. For you to tell me what I can or cannot say, F you. Right? The problem here is not oversharing. The problem here is his over-listening. Right? <laughs> He's hearing too much. Now, is there such a thing as oversharing then? I think oversharing is sharing that which you regret having shared. Right? And we've all gone through that. We've all had to learn. And we do need to educate people. Dana Boyd, I'm sure you all know of Dana Boyd, uh, researcher at Microsoft Labs and now NYU. Uh, brilliant, wonderful Dana Boyd. Taught me so much about this. And says that we overprotect our children, actually. That we need to have them out um, interacting with the world. And um, that the problem here is not the gathering of data, but the use of data. Um, if I walk out, you pick on, on Madigan, um, uh, which I pick on, I pick on again. So if I walk into your office and I apply for a job, you can see in a glance that I have prematurely gray hair <laughs> uh, that my, my, my gender, my race, probably my education, uh, where I'm from, and so on. Certain of that information you may not use to hire me or not hire me. However, you're, you can still do it. You can still say I'm not going to hire that old fart. And nothing's going to stop you. However, if you do it again and again and again and again, there's a pattern there. But we cannot make you forget that I had prematurely gray hair. It's impossible. Yet, what we're trying to do now is talk about a right of forgetting. We're trying to manage the gathering of information. And that's a dangerous thing to do. Because when you do that, you cut off 
flows of information. And you also potentially, in this notion of the right to forget, by the way, impinge on someone else's freedom of speech. If um, I write about you and you complain and there are laws that make me take this down, you've now impinged upon my free speech to say what I think of you for not hiring me because I have prematurely gray hair. So we have to be careful of where we go with these unintended consequences. I just wrote an op-ed about COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, that um, you know uh, uh, decrees that a site may not know basically anything specific about a child under 13, right? Like even what town you're in, anything, right? So if you want to do a geography game and have people start from their home, you can't do it unless you have the explicit permission of the parent. And under the newly revised regulations, the parent can't even respond by email. The parent has to print out facts or, um, facts, remember that? Uh, or scan the document or get on a video conference with the employee. Of the, of the company. So clearly no one does. So I was on a call uh, with a Freedom of Privacy Forum. I was on a call with the attorney, lead attorney on this at the FTC, and I asked her a couple questions about what I saw as the unintended consequences of COPPA. One, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog and everyone is 14. We are teaching children to lie about their age, right? No one is under 13. Number two, I, asked, I said, do you have any data about how much, they, how much truth you get about age? None. Second question, how much do parents avail themselves of these means of notice and consent? No data. Three, the most important thing in my mind is that we, the unintended consequence here is that children are the worst served demographic online, by far. I started a site, the second site I started to learn the web back in 95, oh my children, um, was the yuckiest site on the internet about cockroaches and goo in, in, with the Liberty Science Center in New Jersey. And it was a lot of fun, we sold it to Discover, it's still around. You can learn about your snot. Um, <laughs> and, um, after we sold it, my, my employer said, we're not doing that again with COPPA because it's, the risk is too great. So we are, the unintended consequence here is that we underserve children because we try to negotiate the wrong thing. Other unintended consequences. Uh, Australia is looking at putting filters up on all content on the net just to get to porn, child porn. Well, child porn's a banned thing, but they've created an architecture in that case that can be used in Iran and used in China and used by despots. And we shouldn't allow that to happen to our net. But that's where this privacy talk goes if it goes too far. Um, trying to... Let me talk for a moment about identity because it's, it's a hot topic and I think it's a fascinating topic. So a lot of talk these days about the real name fight you started, you Google started because of Google+. And um, whose fault is it? Who did it? Uh, I think I know actually. Uh, a little birdie told me. Um, and and uh, here's the way I talk about it with people. Let me try it this way. I believe that the key insight that Facebook and Zuckerberg had was real people, real relationships. And uh, that that did in fact add value to the discourse and the quality of discourse on the net. Uh, it's not the cure-all to trolls and bozos. There are many trolls and bozos I know by name. So. <laughs> Identity alone doesn't solve that problem. But, but identity does bring up the, the investment people have um, in, in this. So I think that it's beneficial. There, there is still an absolute and permanent need for anonymity and pseudonymity. That's part of free speech. It is part of uh, enabling the vulnerable uh, whistleblowers, dissidents, and tyrannies to be able to speak. So I will defend anonymity. I will defend pseudonymity and nicknames for various reasons. But I do think that identity is a good thing. I think candidly, Google Plus went a little too far in trying to say that only a real name is a guarantee of it being a real person. And you also put yourself in a bad bind because you became the arbiters of that at Google Plus versus at Facebook, it's really the community that's more the arbiter of it. The bloodstream rejects fake beings. And the bloodstream here doesn't do that. So I, I suspect you, I know that you'll come around and, uh, is that me? Hello? No, it's me. It's you, it's you. It's me. I thought I'd turn it off. Of all people, we're not having It is, it is, it is. Oh no, I have to take this. No, I won't. <laughs> I only did that once. Now you see how I ripped my jacket. Um, We've had that before, by the way. Room's calling here. Okay. That'd be fun. I'd have a conversation with somebody. I'd like that. Um, 
All right, identity. All right, so yeah, I, I, I think that went too far. I understand why it was there. I, I think you've got to find more subtlety and nuance in this. But I also understand that there's great value to having an identity online and to have a verified identity online. I mean, I'm a fan of Howard Stern, and when Biz Stone went to visit Howard one time, the um, uh, office uh, crew had a fight over, Howard decided to make a game out of it and torture them. And so three of the people who really wanted to be identified on Twitter, he said that Biz would identify one of them. Uh, Ronnie the limo driver won. Um, there's a value to identity. There's a value to verification. Uh, there's a value to having your, your name out there. So I think we've got to find ways in which we encourage identity. We encourage that. We reward it um, uh, rather than instead playing whack-a-mole with the fake ones. I also think that we have to find more reasons why identity is useful online. And there's danger here too. If governments issue internet licenses, that's bad for everybody. And it's not good. We don't want a single verified identity because governments will then require you to use it. And there goes the internet. So there's a role to identity that I think you have to be able to play with. Then the other side of that is, I say in the book that I, can tr I pretty much control my identity, but you control my reputation. Right? When you leave this room, you can say, oh, that guy's a bozo, he talks too fast, he thinks he's funny, um, I wish he wouldn't talk about his penis, whatever. And you can tell the world that, and that's my reputation. So you control my reputation, I control my identity. It's a little, that's too simplistic, it's not quite right, but, but there's a variance there. So there are questions of authority and certification and uh, trust and other things where I'm sure you in your algorithmic wisdom will find ways to help people determine these things through scenes like reputation that will, will or will not be tied to identity that become really interesting. I think we've gotta get a lot more nuanced about identity. Just as Facebook finally got more nuanced than like or ignore, I think identity has become far more nuanced and it's very difficult. All right, heading toward the end. Uh, I talk in the book about open businesses and how to run businesses openly, and you do that very well to an extent and don't to an extent. I don't think that's necessarily that interesting. I talk about a company called For You because you're you. Um, uh, it is to others, I hope. Um, uh, a company called Local Motors that is designing cars in public. Uh, there's still the CEOs in charge of the company, but uh, they have an open design competition for the cars and uh, a kid at Pasadena won $20,000 designing the first one and then they did the individual parts and the little elements of the car and somebody designed a taillight lens that the community fell in love with. And the CEO, who's still responsible for putting out a safe car and an economically viable car, said to the community, okay, it's beautiful, but if I tool up to make this custom part, it's gonna add a thousand bucks to the price of every car. Do you still want it? And they rose as one and said, never mind. <laughs> And they went looking for uh, alternate parts. They settled on a $75 Honda taillight lens that I would never recognize. What fascinates me about that is here's a company, you, know, you look at the auto industry, it is secret to the extreme. Literally, they cloak the cars until they finally take the cloak off and we all yawn. Well, here's a place where they share the entire process. They share the specs of the car so that people can make products for them, can make the taillight lenses. That's really hard for them to do, but they get great benefit out of it by running the company openly. And in this case, here were the customers um, sh sharing in design and economic decisions about the product. I think that's remarkable, but they were given the trust and opportunity to do so. So there's other examples like that. Uh, I think we have new companies like Kickstarter starting where you, you even use your customer's capital to start the product, that's fascinating. All kinds of views of open companies, but I'll skip over that. I do a lot of discussion, uh, some discussion as well about open government and what that really should mean. And it's not just about transparency. It's not just about gotcha. It's also about collaboration. It's also about moving past. And I think we're gonna to go uh, to a, we have the potential to go to a world where we start to question even the notion of a nation. I think that's what we're seeing in Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring and Iceland coming back from its um, economic disaster by, by rewriting their constitution using Facebook. Okay, cool, plugs on that. Um, might be better. Um, and so on. So I, I, I think if government starts to change, the notion of a nation and society start to change, and, and I go through that as well. But I wanna skip finally to this one point that I think is the most important in my mind and that I wanna recruit you on, is that I end the book with a call to defend the principles of openness in society and the net. And, and my argument is that companies cannot be in the position to um, secure the openness of the net. The one company that's in the best position to do it is this one. 
And in China, in my personal view, you were on the wrong side, then you were on the right side, you defended in the end your principles, and I salute you for that as a company. Verizon, on the other hand, um, the, the net neutrality uh, different on the wireless and wired net, as I've called it online, the, the, the internet and the Schmidternet, which by the way is not an Eric Schmidt joke, it's a Yiddish joke, just to be clear here. Uh, I don't think that was a very good move on Google's part. Well, but you're a company and you're now tied with these devils called phone companies and you've got to do things companies do and I understand that, I don't like it, Maybe probably some of you don't either. But that means you are in no position to be the defender of the net, and neither do you want to be. As Eric Schmidt has said, you don't have diplomats, except for Dave Drummond. You don't have um, police forces and laws. So you're not in a position to be the defender of the net, and if you aren't, no company is. Uh, governments, well, I went to the EG8 conference in Paris where I had the audacity to challenge Sarkozy and uh, ask him to take a, a Hippocratic oath for the net, first do no harm. He dismissed it. Ah, you call it harm if I protect your children and your copyright and your privacy? There's no harm. Be harder on me. I said, well, it could be harm. Depends on how you do it. Depends on who does it. I don't trust government to have sovereignty over the net. Have you all read John Perry Barlow's wonderful Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace? Has anyone read that? Oh, you've got to do it. Oh, it's, it's brilliant, right? It's over the top as hell. Google it, pardon me. Um, when you leave, I'm serious, and do uh, dramatic readings of it. It's magnificent. You know, people of the future, you have no sovereignty in this land where we live, this land of the mind. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Weary giants. It, well, weary, weary giants of steel, and yeah, it's, 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 it's brilliant. He's a little embarrassed about being so over the top, but I tried to get him to do a dramatic reading on Twig once, and he wouldn't. Um, uh, it's, it's wonderful. So I came along and I thought, well, what do we need? Do we need a constitution for the net? No because I don't want it to ever be codified in that way. Do we need a Bill of Rights for the net? Well, but who enforces it? Who says what it is? And I came to believe that what we need is a discussion, not a set, but a discussion of the principles of a public society and an open net. And I put forward some of mine. They're wrong. They're not right. But I had to you know, volunteer something. I don't think we'll ever get to a single set, but if we have the conversation, I think we will start to discern principles that hold us together so that when a government does something bad, we can point to this and say you violated that, and also so we can give companies cover so that at some point when Google's in a difficult position with China or Verizon, um, you know, they can say, well, no, but the people of the net really are going to raise a ruckus because we know that. But we, the people of the net, haven't done this. Sarkozy brought together what he thought was the internet. Larry Lessig from Harvard said, the future of the internet is not here because they didn't know how to get invited and you didn't know to invite them. Uh, but he thought he brought together the world and the net. Why did we go to his table? Why shouldn't we invite him to our table, us the citizens of the net? So will companies defend the openness of the net? No. Will governments do so? No, we must in fact defend it against some governments. Who will defend the openness of the net? We, the people of the net, must. And I think we have to start by not just thinking like hackers and hacking around these obstacles. We have to start deciding on what these principles are because we are in fact and in indeed building a new society. So here's my list. Um, and it is an imperfect list and a wrong list, but it's the discussion that I want. First, that we have a right to connect. Not necessarily in the Finnish sense of everyone being online through uh, or law, but certainly in the sense that if Mubarak shuts you off from the net, he has violated your human rights. We have a right to speak. We have a right to act and assemble. We, um, there is a, an ethic of publicness. There is an ethic of privacy that we should be following. What's public is a public good. And this I say after watching Google and its Verpixel Unsrecht enable people to blur their homes in Google Plus. Well, there's a, pro there's a problem there that um, Google was taking pictures from a public street of a public view. And if Google can be told not to do that, then perhaps journalists and citizens can be told not to. And whenever you limit the public sphere, you're robbing from the public. Um, our governments and our institutions, including companies, should be moving toward transparency by default and secrecy by necessity. We operate the other way today. Two more, every bit is created equal and that when one bit is discriminated against, whether that's by Comcast telling you not to watch this movie versus that one, 
whether that's China saying you can't search on Falun Gong, whether that's Mubarak shutting off the internet, whether that's Australia filtering all content. If one bit is free, then none is free. None is presumed to be free. So all bits must be free. That's the essence of net neutrality, I think. And finally, the architecture of the net must remain distributed and open because that's what it is. No one can have sovereignty over the net. That's what makes the net the net. And indeed, as we start to see society in various ways mimic this architecture of the net, I think we have to treat that architecture as something more holy to hold up. So these are the things that I hope that we defend. And what I would like to see from the likes of Google is a defense of publicness, is a defense of openness. Not just from a defensive position, but from an offensive position or saying that these are good things for society. These are things that we all need. These are things that you enable and that we believe in. And if we don't do that, then it'll be taken over by bad governments and bad companies and bad people and spammers over Matt Cutts' dead, dead body. Um, uh, you know, I always tell everybody in the world that you would think given Matt's job, he would be the meanest son of a bitch you know. And here's, he's one of the nicest guys on earth and it always amazes me about Matt. Um, or maybe I just see his, that public face. Maybe he is a mean son of a bitch from behind. I don't, I, I doubt it. All the time. <laughs> he shares that with a different circle. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's what I wanted to say. I wanted to talk uh, uh, about this with all of you and, and get your pushbacks and get where you are and what you're thinking about all this. Uh, as always, I salute you. You do wonderful things. I'm glad you exist. Uh, and we couldn't live without you. Uh, but we might have to if the net doesn't stay open if what you do gets restricted too much, if it gets restricted in one country versus another country. That's real danger out there. We might have to if good, well-meaning people with well-meaning regulation go overboard and restrict the net so much to the fear of the worst case that you can't build the best case anymore. So I hope that you stay open to this and that you as individuals and companies uh, fight for publicness. So that's what I wanted to say. Let's talk. Let us not, oh good, okay, in this crowd. There's always that embarrassing moment where, it's, where no one will, I'll do it, I'm happy to, if you don't mind, it's all right? You know what, let me just switch mics, because this one I think is wonky. Can I switch sure. mics? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. The other one's good? Yeah, none of them are that good. Oh, I see. <laughs> you're a friggin' technology company. <laughs> you don't make mics. Yeah, I know, you're not hardware. <laughs> is it on? Uh, is this, yeah. it works. So, um, you seem to be conflating uh, two things where you, you say that, uh, well, you say net neutrality is an aspect of publicness, but it actually seems to me like that's an aspect of privateness, that I have the right to not have my ISP inspect my packets and discriminate against this or that behavior. And so you're sort of saying that argument I think we all agree with about net neutrality and then using it to argue that privacy in general is misguided. I know they suck. And we should all be public. So, um, Fair point, and when, when, when someone at Google says you conflate things, you, you, you run for the hills and get nervous. Um, out of respect, I say that. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, but I think it's both. As I said at the beginning, privacy and publicness are not binary. They are not opposite. It is a continuum. If you enable one, you enable both, right? So it's about control. Now, Mark Zuckerberg's definition of privacy was really about control of your information. I think it's an inadequate definition. I accept the first bought it at first. Um, but I think in this case, it's about uh, who controls the bits, right? And in an end-to-end -end architecture, you at the end should control it either way. But if I should control my bits, I should presumably control my cookies for do not track as well, or I should control my personal information from uh, you know, sharing on a social network as well, right? So right. You, are you against that? Am I against that? Yeah. No, I think no. do not track makes sense, but you ah. do Okay, let's talk about that. Do not track makes sense. Why does it make sense? I think the, the, it, the, it, the it, same it, principle it. you described where I should control oh my bits from the ISP, well, why should that be different? Uh, that, that privacy principle that I'm applying to my oh, data that the ISP is inspecting should presumably apply to my data that the website owner is also inspecting. But it's not just about inspecting, it's also about restricting. Right? That's what net neutrality is really about, is someone's going to restrict your bits. <laughs> Struggle. Okay, now I'm going to confuse which one's which. You hold on to that one. <laughs> is this a good one? Hello? Yeah, this is good. Oh, God, voice, voice of God. Um, all right, so this is one of those cases. <laughs> what? All right. It's trying to be Oprah. <laughs> Oprah Habermas. Um, <laughs> Okay, so now I've got to think about this. Yes, there's a control, but 
I don't necessarily buy that net neutrality is the same as privacy. I think they are both issues of control. They're different issues of control, right? The first issue of privacy that you have is it's in your head, and if it doesn't go out in your head, then that's the, that's the most secure place you have, right? Then you choose to share something. Now, the problem we have in the discussion of privacy is we've, we've gotten to the point, I think I said earlier, where people think that the internet is a vault where you store things. It's a really shitty vault, right? You shouldn't put things on the internet if you want them not, the world not to know this, right? Uh, well, yeah, I know, and, 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 uh, but I also defend him in the book that the 21 joke was a joke. Um, but yeah, I tend, to, I tend to believe that, 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 that at some point or another, uh, if I tell Chris something, uh, I, have, I have handed over my fate to Chris. Yeah, especially. Uh, right? So, so I've, I've made that decision. He has the responsibility now, but I've lost control over it to that extent, right? So the con best control I had was to keep it here and not tell him. So there's a control issue, but once I've given it up, I've given it up. Now, now let's go to bigger data, right? So the fact that I searched for flu, right? Sergey says that if we turn off, if, we, if, we, if we're forced to erase those searches too early, then... Um, you may not have the data necessary to see the, the uh, anomalous events that would let you predict uh, the next um, pandemic, right? So was that search for flu mine because I did it? No, it became Google's to the extent that I, I used you to do it. It became maybe the public's to an extent. These are all different variations, I think. But uh, hit me back. I don't, I'm going to answer your question. I don't want to dominate the discussion. I think the mic doesn't work, so. <laughs> Um, I gotta think about this one. I'll blog it. I'll a, Google Plus it. Or attack on do not track by saying, well, it might be uh, websites to put up paywalls. If consumers would rather support websites by paying than by having their data sold to the advertisers that are targeted to them, I think the market is working. And that's, you know, ah, okay. Well, that, that, if the market does it, then let the market do it. Don't regulate it. There's no reason well, well, to legislate that. that. I have the opportunity right now to uh, deprive the sites of cookies. I can use, I can, I can turn them off at a session, I can turn them off permanently, I can kill them after a session, I can use incognito. I can do all those things today. All those, all those tools are in my hands today, right? So why do we need do not track on top of that, except for the fact that do not call was really popular and Congress wants to pass things that start with do not as a result. I don't think we need do not track at all, and I think that, 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 in fact, that's an example of how we've done a bad job as an industry of saying, uh, of allowing cookies to be demonized, in some cases because we misuse them, yes, but in some cases because we didn't get out there and say tracking is not all that bad. All right, I'll, I'll think about this and we'll see you on Google+. Plus. What's your name so I can watch you on Google+. Plus? What's my name? Yeah, will you say that? What's that? Can I follow you on Google+. Plus? If you can find me. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Should we even bother? Yes. Or repeat the questions. I'll repeat the questions. Um, so why are you such a big proponent of net neutrality if the market forces competition could handle that as well? <laughs> I believe that the key to net neutrality is competition. Absolutely. Um, Not right. So that's that's the argument. That's the, the libertarian argument is that net neutrality is a form of regulation. Al Franken said at South by Southwest, he said that's been mischaracterized, that all we're doing is trying to get the internet to stay as it was. We're not trying to change the internet, we're trying to keep the internet the way it was and not allow people to come in and create new restrictions that didn't exist before. So what we're protecting is the essence of the pure internet in his argument. But I still agree with you absolutely, the real solution here is competition. The real solution is if you have the shitty service that restricts things versus the good service that doesn't, the market, I believe, will pick the good things. I like to wander around. So you're, if, if there was competition and one entity decided to restrict bits, that's okay? If there were competition, yeah. Tom Evslin, who uh, started, uh, Tom Evslin should be a hero to all of us. He was the guy at AT&T WorldNet who took the clock off the internet and put on flat pricing at 1995 a month. He's the guy who made the internet go boom. So we love Tom. Uh, Tom then started a, a VoIP company, uh, arbitraging VoIP. Tom taught me about this, and Tom's a libertarian, and Tom said, even so, we probably need temporary regulation until we have competition. Where's the competition gonna come from? Well, your leaders have pushed for the white areas to be unregulated spectrum. 
uh, the white spaces on, on, on broadcast, uh, Wi-Fi on steroids, so-called, right? If we had that, if it were truly unregulated spectrum, I believe there'd be no need for regulation. In the meantime, however, we are prisoned. You know, there are a few companies that treat us like prisoners, airlines, phone companies, and cable companies. Because we are. And, and what? Facebook. Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> He said that, I didn't. Uh, uh, nah, I won't go there. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I think, I think regulation, uh, if you want to view net neutrality as regulation, not protection, which is fine, then I think it's a temporary means, yeah. Yeah. You're just going to try to get up or try it. This notion of privacy as an ethic of knowing, I think, is one of the really like, light bulb moments in your book. that it's, You can't restrict the flow of data, and if you try to, it's bad, but you really have to think about what people do with the data. And one consequence, you still seem to see a lot of gotcha people outing private data. There's this asymmetry. You know, it's like, oh, let's beat up Clinton for having an affair, even though we're having an affair too, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, how do we get to the point where if we really want to take this ethic of knowing seriously, people are going to have to def stand up when bad private things are, you know, exposed to people and say, hey, nope, you, you abused your ethic of knowing, therefore we're not going to hold them against that, as opposed to now it still seems like there's too much willingness to glom onto the things that were improperly exposed from privacy. And, and not sort of reflexively saying, nope, you know, that's, that wasn't okay. Right, so, so an ethic of not using people's stuff against them perens unless they deserve it, which is the journalistic exception. Right. <laughs> because that's what we do, is use people's information yeah, against I them. I mean, do you think you need to start seeing the press or other people stand up and say, hey, and pointing at, basically calling people on violating that ethic of knowing if it really is going to be something that we take seriously? Yeah, I, don't forget, I'm, I'm a utopian and an optimist, but I hope that's where the norms start to go. Yes, I have a theory of mutually assured humiliation, right? I have my embarrassing pictures, you have your embarrassing pictures. If you attack me, I attack you, so you don't. Arms down, right? Um, now that, I believe, leads to a more tolerant society, and that's to me is the first step here. Some would say too tolerant, right? Some people said that being nice to gays is too tolerant, but screw them. Um, uh, so a society that uh, becomes more open to more behaviors and less condemning of them is by definition a more tolerant society, and I think that's where we go with more publicness. We could go the opposite. Yes, there's no, there's no guarantee of any of this. The, the technology doesn't determine and guarantee any of this, and it could go the opposite, and the society could, could find more ways to condemn more people. That's, that's what happens. But I, I start this with an inherent faith in humankind and think that it's in our interests to have a better, nicer place to live and be ourselves and be free to be ourselves. Cue Sesame Street. So um, if, you, if you imagine a world where, uh, I guess we live in information abundance and all bits are free, um, I'm curious what your thoughts on are about teaching people about the value of data or about perhaps relative value of data where some information could be more valuable than other information depending on the context, depending on the use, depending on the aggregation. How do we get people to believe that storing their data for long periods of time so they can like, you know, make use of it perhaps 20 years down the road um, and do so either personally or in aggregate through communities um, is a better way to go. This goes to the whole issue of publicness, whether it's data or other, other forms. I think that, that you've got to show, we talked about this um, when I did earlier, we've got to show those benefits. And it's not a case of us having a, us who believe in this, having a, most of us, uh, having a, um, a marketing pitch. It's about anecdotes, case studies, uh, best practices, real things people do for real reasons and they benefit from it. That's why I tell the prostate stuff is because even in that case, uh, I had great benefit. And I, you know, it was, I have no regret about doing what I did. Um, Do you see a more germane sort of like day-to-day -day stuff? I, they don't see the benefits yet. So how do you prove the benefits to people, right? How do you prove, I mean, Gmail proves it to me, right? Because I can now go back and find people. Uh, Gmail could prove it to me. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, Priority Inbox proves it to me because the fact that you, Google, can learn about that and can, it's, it's, it's a miracle. It's a friggin' miracle, right? It's great. Uh, that's, a, that's a demonstration of it. I think we've got to demonstrate it. Um, uh, you're also kind of touching, I'm going to go to another point because it just inspires me to do so, but, but it's, it's related, not related. Value. Where is value encased? We in media think value is encased in content. I went out to lunch with the former head of a network a news operation a few months ago, and he said, you know, at damn Google and Facebook, they, I don't mean to make him sound like an old fart, but um, <laughs> them youngins, uh, they use 
uh, our steel and media to make their cars. And they don't, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't value our content, he said. And I said, no, actually come to think of it, it's the opposite. The only content you value is the content you make. Because you think that only the stuff you make is a content because you're the content person. Mark and Google see content everywhere and value content everywhere, value it as data, right? And go back to signals, that the, the value is in the relationships and the data about them. Content is a valuable tool to get there, but all the value is not encased in the content. So this is why we have the discussion about paywalls now. Right? And this is why we have this idea of ownership. And we go back to this idea of owning my data. Well, if you take that from me, it's just wrong of you to do that. Well, but you can get other value. Well, we're not showing that. And well, you know what? It's actually not that valuable. If you don't do it, okay, fine. Others are going to do it and learn. Um, so we've got to get past this notion of where the value is encased, I think. And the only way we're going to do it, I think, is by demonstration. Oh, sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm struck by... Um, I'm struck by... I'm happy to stay and talk as long as anybody wants. I've got a red eye tonight, so... Okay. I'm struck by the potential to use the, a lot of medical studies that go look for control groups. Mm -hmm. They mean they have to find them. If you had all the medical records for everybody in the country, you wouldn't have to recruit a control group. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought, thank you. It's new ammunition. Yeah. Um, because and you know the control circumstances. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and if you actually allow people, if people were, were I know a guy who published his, his uh, DNA test results. Right. Okay. Imagine people just did that. That was just considered to be a normal thing to do. And to do the same thing for medical. And also to go to a website and tell them a whole bunch of other things about you. And say, okay, medical researchers or some guy with a degree in statistics who wakes up at one in the morning and has an idea, he gets on and he just goes for it. The number of people who could do medical research would be staggering. Would be, would be stacked. It would be a order of magnitude or more larger. Right. So how do we get there as a society? Well, I think we've got to talk about the value of publicness even to that extent. And that's going to freak people out. Right? It's going to really freak people out. But why? Again, one, job, you legislate that. Two, you regulate it. Two, insurance. Your Obamacare took away, let's hope it stays, uh, pre-existing conditions. But three, the hardest one is stigmas. Right? The, look what women have done with breast cancer. And there was a column, I think, today in the, in, in the Times or somewhere saying we've gone overboard. The Washington Post. I don't think so. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do with prostate. Other people are doing right? What are you trying to do? You're trying to take away a stigma. You're trying to make it okay to talk about this so that people can get data and get information. We're a long way from that. Um, you know, part of the fear is, uh, you know, my concern in being so public is I don't want to drag my family into my glass house. By telling you about my conditions, I have revealed my children's DNA. Uh, Esther Dyson, when I said that to Esther Dyson, who's, who's published her genome, uh, she said, get over it, Jeff. Everybody gets prostate cancer. It's okay. Um, uh, a very Esther scientific view. Um, uh, but yes, we've got to get to that point. But as a society, we're so far away from it. And we're going in the wrong direction. Right? So it's, it's, it's a great example and a great case of proving the value to you and society of being open. How do you think we get there? Uh, uh, appeal to disease interest groups mm -hmm. so that the members of the disease families put their stuff up along with the, you know, and go to other interest groups say, we'll do it for you if you do it for us. You can use us for controls. We can use you for controls. I mean, 20, uh, not 23 me. Well, 23 me is part of that, but, but uh, patients like me, you know that side, right? I think is, is pretty amazing. And it's under anonymity, which is okay, but people get to share their dosages and side effects and, and so on and so forth. And it has real value. A friend of mine's wife has MS, and he said that this has been absolutely invaluable to her uh, because you can see the dosages and where it goes. Uh, for my many conditions, um, you know, I would love to have that kind of community. I went to patients like me, and because they opened up, they only started with about a dozen uh, very serious disorders. They've now opened up to a lot, but if I go in for thyroid cancer, there's like one other person, and who's taking my drug, so I don't have any critical mass of data. Yeah, disease side effects are greatly underreported because I know lots of people have gotten a prescription, they've tried it, they felt funny, they never told their doctor they stopped using right. it. But if everyone who had ever used that disease had said so, you could go and find all these and say, oh, look. I'm going to sound like my parents down in Sun City Center in Florida, uh, uh, going through, as they call it, the organ recital here. Uh, condition I got after 9-11 is atrial fibrillation, an irregular heartbeat. And uh, 
you get, uh, I'm, under the, I'm under the care of a, of a magnificently named drug called Rhythmol. It gives me rhythm. Uh, I knock on what it works. Uh, people have uh, onsets of AFib, and it's rather mysterious why they do. And my simple uh, wish for this is if every AFib patient felt free to describe their days, 48 hours, what they ate, what they did, what they thought before an onset, I got to believe that there's some correlations to be found. And not doing that hurts every one of those people and increases our costs and does all these bad things. But we're in a mode now of going the opposite direction, not only in privacy, but also on information. The, the decision made by the government panel last week on prostate PSA testing was that statistically, and I'm speaking to the wrong group here about statistics, statistically, um, uh, it doesn't save lives. Well, as a, as, a, as a cohort, perhaps, but as an individual, it gave me information. Now, perhaps I shouldn't have had the operation because you can't tell the difference between slow-moving and fast-moving prostate cancer. Well, until they can't figure that out, I'm gambling. Do I want to gamble with the cancer in me or the cancer out of me? As far as I'm concerned, I would always have better have more information than less. The use of what I do with that may be flawed. Maybe I shouldn't have had the operation. But I had no basis to know, and it was my gamble. What the panel was saying was, it's the pool's gamble. It's a financial gamble. Well, I hate that, right? What that says is the government is telling you, better to be ignorant. That is never a good policy, right? More information, I gotta believe you believe this at Google, more information is always better than less information, yeah? And, you know, it's not okay. Um, uh, so this is where I say that I think that Google being the position it's in has to find a way to fight for these kinds of things, to demonstrate it to people, to argue for it, to lobby not just to Congress, but to lobby to the people and start to come up with pilot groups and you're a platform for that and show how it's possible. And yes, it's gonna be counterintuitive when it comes to privacy, but that's good too, because you can show examples of how radical publicness of those who were willing and those who chose helped more people. That's a good thing. As you guys are prompt, like, I'm happy to stay to talk as long as you want, but you won't be rude if you leave. So I guess, how's that? Anybody else want to challenge me in any way? Or you want to get back to work? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.